Morning again, everyone. And a shout out to everybody who tunes in and watches us online. Welcome. So this pastor in this rural uh, church in Tennessee dies, and the congregation insists that the senior deacon take over for the pastor until they find his replacement. And the deacon approached the first Sunday very nervously, a little concerned that he might get judged, he might get compared with his efforts to filling in for the pastor. So he nervously begins the service saying, uh, how many people have a pen? And everybody puts up their hands. And he says, and how many people have some paper? And everybody holds up some paper. And he says, good, because today we're going to have a contest. And I want you to listen very carefully to everything I say. And if anything, if I make any mistake or if there's something you don't like, I just want you to uh, write it down. And don't hold anything back. The more critical you are, the better. And um, we're going to take the list up at the end of service. And then he paused and he looks out at everybody. Very stern look. And then he said, uh, we're going to count up. And the person with the longest list is going to win the grand prize of getting to preach next Sunday. <laughs> See, I absolutely believe that you, before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you criticize them, you're a mile away, and you have their shoes. <laughs> that, is, that is bad. That is bad. That is. How do you follow that? Jesus said, do not judge Reverend Mirage's jokes so that you may not be judged. Jimmy, did you put that in there? Did you? For the measurement with which you judge, you will be judged. Jesus also said, do not condemn that you will not be condemned. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? You know, these words are more powerful than we realize. Because what Jesus is saying here is that one of the most common things that we do that prevent us from experiencing the kingdom of heaven and prevent us from experiencing the fullness of life and the fullness of God's peace and love is when we judge. It is when we harshly judge ourselves and others. It is when we condemn ourselves and others and are critical of ourselves and others and situations that we literally block the flow of our experience of God. And the funny thing about it is, most of us don't really think that we judge. But the fact is, every one of us judges. We judge how people look. We judge what people wear. We judge how people talk. We judge what they do. We judge what they don't do. We judge what happens, what didn't happen, what could have happened. We judge. We judge our bosses. That guy's such an ignorant jerk. The only reason he has that job is because his dad owns the company. You know, we, we judge our family members. We judge our exes. Oh, she's a lunatic. She's a nut. They ought to lock her up. <laughs> it is amazing. We judge our neighbors. You know, we judge drivers. Look at that lunatic. He's so inconsiderate. What a clown. They ought to take his license away. And that coach, he made such a terrible call. He's such a bum. They ought to get rid of him. And these things sound silly and funny, but, you know, we do them. And when we do them consistently, we don't realize by divine law, by the law of cause and effect, as we spew harsh and negative and critical things about others, we are actually hurting ourselves. We are attracting more of that energy. When we tear each other down and are critical and are mean, we actually create more negative energy in our own lives. And it actually blocks us from living at a higher level of love and joy and peace and gratitude and compassion and fulfillment. So we're in the sixth week of a nine-week series called Mastering Life. And we're looking at the book This Life is Joy by Roger Thiel, who's a senior minister at the Mile High Church in Denver. If you'd like, the book is available in the previous five talks. You can get them uh, in the bookstore. But we're looking at the fact that every year, that when we start the year, we always want to have a better life. So we set goals like, um, you know, increase our income, losing some weight, uh, getting a, a new car or a bigger house. And what we're looking at this year is instead of just setting those types of goals, why don't we set a higher intention? What would it be like if we set an intention to improve our lives of living a more awakened life? To living a more conscious life? You know, to live uh, a more enlightened life? 
and to live a more masterful life. Wouldn't that be cool to live a, a, a life that is more masterful than we're currently living? And what would that look like for you in how you show up in life if you live more masterfully in your relationship? You live more masterfully in how you interact at work or how masterfully you deal with yourself and all the situations of life. To me, living a masterful life begins with an understanding that life is governed by spiritual laws, that there are universal laws uh, that are going on that we are sometimes not aware of that limit us from uh, being as successful and productive in our interactions. You know, I told you about the TV show Kung Fu. You know, we always think that being masterful is about being the fastest or the most powerful, you know, working the hardest. And yet, those Kung Fu masters, they weren't as, as, as fast or as in good shape as the young guys, but they were beating all of them because they had a level of awareness a level of insight, a level of understanding and experience that they tended to be more efficient and effective in all their moves, and they lived at a more masterful level, even though they weren't as fast, even though they weren't as strong, because they had a higher level of awareness that guided all their actions and their interactions. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live a more masterful life? And the way to live a more masterful life is to have a more masterful relationship with all the things in our lives that we think limit us and stop us from living as great a life as we want. And so what we're going to look at today is how do we have a more master relationship with judgment and how do we have a more masterful relationship with conflict? Now, the first thing about judgment we need to know is, uh, is to realize that there is a difference between discernment and judgment. Discernment is evaluating what is the highest and best for us, what are, what are better ways for us uh, to show up in life, what are better things for us to say or not say or do or not do. It is an evaluation that's a higher level of awareness that taps into our wisdom to say this is better and this is worse or this is something I should engage in and this is something I shouldn't or these are behaviors that I think are unacceptable or this is the relationship that might not be a smart thing for me to, uh, to get into. Discerning raises our level of awareness and uses a level of spiritual wisdom and insight to judge and evaluate the things about ourselves, our world, and what we should do, not do, or say, or not say. You know when scripture says, do not judge by appearances, but judge by righteous judgment? And it's saying, is evaluate the things in life from a spiritually aware place, from a spiritually grounded place, not from a reactive place, not from an ego place, but from a spiritually centered place. And the thing that's different from uh, discernment and judgment is discernment uh, and judgment is that judgment tends to be more, it's got a higher level of negativity, intensity, and frequency. That not only are we spewing negative energy and it's blocking our experience of God, but sometimes we get locked into our judgment. Most of us actually believe that our judgments aren't judgment. They're just our true reflection of the facts. That's what we really think. We think it's just a fact, but it's really a story we made up based on our own fear or hurt uh, or upset. And then the other thing is not only do we believe that it's reality, but we believe that we're right. And that song, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Well, with judgment, it's is that I am wrong and I still want to be right. And then we're not only right, but self-righteous and superior in our rightness. But here's the worst part about judgment. Here's where judgment really hurts us is a judgment is a way that we deflect doing our own spiritual work. Judgment avoids us being honest, being vulnerable, and being more self-aware of what's really going on with us. And, and it, it's a way to deflect and avoid doing our spiritual work, reaching a greater self, uh, level of self-realization and self-actualization. Every time we judge someone else, we sabotage our own growth. Every time we judge and spew some negativity, we actually inhibit our own healing, our own awakening, and living at the level of life that we are meant to live. So my question for you is, what is your current relationship with judgment? Is it just a reactive thing that you do when life is negative or you don't show up or other people don't show up as well? Well, here's a more masterful way to have a relationship with judgment, and that is to realize that every time we judge, it is a yearning of the soul to be healed and liberated and to open ourselves to be more whole and complete and to live a more masterful life. 
Here are two wonderful lessons of judgment and our relationship with judgment um, from the New Testament. The first one is with Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery. The Pharisees brought this woman who was caught in adultery because it broke the, uh, the rules. And the rules were, if people were caught in adultery, both of them were supposed to be stoned. Since women considered second-class citizens, only the woman was going to be stoned in this particular situation. And what the Pharisees were doing, they were really trying to catch Jesus because for him to follow the, uh, the, the, the rules, um, the Jewish rules, he would have to say it was okay to stone her. But if he allowed her to be stoned, the Romans would have um, been upset that he was uh, inciting uh, and it would have charged him with insurrection. So the Pharisees knew either decision was not going to be good for Jesus. So there was a place to trap him. And so there's the angry crowd ready to shoot some stones, condemning the woman. And what does Jesus do? He goes to a higher level and says, he who is without sin, let them cast the first stone. And suddenly these people who are angry and ready to throw a stone and condemn went, oh, oh, I guess I've done some stuff. They dropped their stones and they walked away. Interesting, in that one question, Jesus turned hostility and judgment and condemnation to compassion, to humility, and it transformed that energy from anger to peace. And that's how powerful that when we judge, that it is an invitation for us to take a look inside, to take stock, to look at the speck in our own eye, and sometimes awaken us to realize that this, what we're doing isn't a healthy thing for us or for the other person or any situation. And then the second one uh, was when Jesus was beginning his ministry and kind of recruiting the uh, disciples, the first one he recruited was Philip. And then Philip told his friend Nathaniel, he said, Nathaniel, Jesus asked me to go and be his disciple. And then Nathaniel said, so where's this Jesus guy from? And then uh, uh, Philip says, oh, he's from Nazareth. And then uh, Nathaniel says, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth at the time was a despised place. It was ugly. It was like an armpit. And it was not very uh, beautiful. It was a poor place. And Jesus was born in Nazareth. Jesus came out of Nazareth. And the point that we're making here is that sometimes we judge the places in our lives that aren't beautiful, that we think nothing good can come of. Sometimes we say, because of my dysfunctional family, nothing, I can't make something good of myself because I don't have a great education, because I've made these mistakes, because I feel so much guilt or regret for what I've done. Nothing good could ever come from me. We have these Nazareth places that we despise, that we think good, we judge ourselves and our mistakes and our limitations and our weaknesses, and we keep ourselves down. Where the example of Jesus is knowing that the Christ and the divine can be born even in situations that don't look as ideal as we would like them to be. Judging is a yearning for us of our soul to want to be healed and freed and also to be reassured that I'm okay even though I've made mistakes. That I'm okay even though I don't get it right all the time. I'm okay even though sometimes I feel inferior. I've got wounds. Judgment is a powerful, powerful tool to trigger us looking at the areas that we're saying things that we know that aren't helpful but it also helps us look at the areas we're judging ourselves and our hearts are yearning to feel worthy of love, to be accepted for who we are and realize that good is in us and will come from us regardless of what kind of situations we are in or have been or have come from. And so the three things about spiritual assurance, that's what judgment is trying to do, is trying to call our souls to heal those things and be reassured. And the way we do it is three things. It's a triple A. And that is, number one, is to acknowledge and catch ourselves in this moment when we're being judgmental about others uh, or ourselves. And number two is look at the place in us that we, is to ask, acknowledge, and it's ask, where in my life am I judging myself? Where in my life am I thinking I'm not good enough or I'll never be anything or I'll never be successful? And then ask God to heal that. And then the third is to affirm that we are worthy. To affirm that God made me. God loves me. God has a plan for me, and I'm worthy of a life of happiness and success. Because the more we feel worthy, the less we judge people. 
the more we are worthy, the more we're connected, and the more discerning we are in our decisions and how we treat ourselves, view others in situations. It raises us to a higher level and transforms our relationship with judgment to actually bring the best out of ourselves. Does that make sense, everybody? You know? So it's the more we feel our self-worth, the more we are acknowledge our judgment and ask ourselves, where in my life am I judging me? And asking God to help heal that judgment, heal that place where I don't feel whole, the more likely we are raised to a more masterful level when we catch ourselves in judgment. It'll move us to a level of discernment and spiritual insight. The second one is about conflict. How many people ever had conflict in your life? Anybody ever had some conflict in your life in a relationship? Okay. Thomas Crum said this. He says, our lives are not dependent on whether or not we have conflict. Our lives are dependent on what we do with the conflict. That's what makes the difference. The fact is, as long as they're human beings, they're going to be conflict. Because there's always different ways of seeing things and doing things. Conflict is just a part of life. There's conflict in relationships. There's conflict at work. There's conflict in neighborhoods. There's just conflict. There's a part of life. The question is, what's your relationship with conflict? Is it something you deny or pretend isn't there? Is it something that you fight against or push away or pretend it isn't there? Is it something you just say is bad and it's a sign that things are wrong? So what is your relationship with conflict? Because how we relate to conflict can impact our health, our body, our minds, our souls, and, and our relationships. And if we push it away and bury it, it will fester. And we fight against it, what we resist persists, and it continues on. And so it's an important teaching tool in our lives of how we handle conflict. You know, they did a study of people who lived to uh, 100 years old, centurions, and they said, besides genetics, what are the things that has allowed you to live as long as you lived? And here's what they said. They said, number one is having a positive attitude. Number two is goals, something to look forward to. Number three was having good so social connection, you know, friends and family. And the fourth is being able to let go. Because in 100 years of living, you experience some conflict, some disagreements, some misunderstandings, some things that people say that weren't as nice or we say that weren't as nice or thoughtful. Every one of us has stuff. They're hurts. And we tend as human beings to hold on to that stuff. So one of the most important life skills and spiritual practices is learning how to forgive, learning how to let go, learning how to release the past and release the pain so we can move on. Because it doesn't matter how much education or money you got. If you're stuck in the past and can't get over the bitterness or the hurt or the blame or, how you were, or the betrayal or how you're mistreated, life will never move forward. Life will never, ever move forward and be as fulfilling. So conflict is an opportunity for us to forgive. It is an opportunity for us to let go and to free ourselves to greater things. You know, forgiveness uh, is cleansing, it is healing, it is transforming that old energy and those toxic emotions that we've held on to. Here are the things that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not getting self-righteous and going on your high horse and saying, you know what, I've decided I'm going to forgive you for what you did. You worm of the dust, now get out of my life. So it's not, like, it's not like a nice little parting gift we have as we kick somebody out of our life or what they did. It's also not reminding someone that you forget. Oh, you remember, I forgave you for that thing you did. And when you forget, I will remind you again that I forgave you for that thing you did. And you know what you did. I don't need to remind you about what you did. You remember what you did to me that I forgave you for. That's not forgiveness. And another one, it's not being a martyr. Oh, I forgive you. You know, and if you do it again, I'll probably forgive you because uh, you'll just walk all over me because I'm a forgiver. That's not forgiving either. Forgiving is a spiritual practice of releasing the negative emotions and feelings that we've held on to for whatever we've done or others have done that we think has caused us pain. It's not forgetting what happened. It's being able to look back at what happened, but not having the toxic emotions and anger and upset be triggered again in us. Anybody ever thought you forgave you gave someone and five years later, you know, they either called you, you saw them again, and it triggered it again? Anybody have that experience? That is not a bad thing. What it means is forgiveness is a process that takes time. And sometimes our soul and our emotions and our mindset can let go some of it, and then life will go on, and it gets triggered again, and it means your soul is ready to 
take a deeper level of that out and to be cleansed and to be more whole. It's not a failure. It's to understand it's a process. So if it pops up again and you thought it was gone, you didn't do anything wrong. You're actually now ready to take the next step in freeing and liberating yourselves because some of these things have been buried for a long time. Forgiveness is a powerful and important cleansing and healing and freeing practice. Peter, in the Bible, asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive Jesus? As many as seven times? And Jesus said, no, as many as 70 times seven. And the number seven in the Bible actually represents completion. And so 70 times seven means forgive all the time. Every time you get hurt and feel disappointed, do a practice of forgiveness and cleanse. And don't let that stuff accumulate and build up till you bust or get upset and flip out. Forgive on a regular basis and free yourself from that toxic energy so you can move forward to live. People always ask the question, so how do I forgive? You don't need to know God will help you forgive. You just need to create the conditions for God to do that healing. And the first one is, are you willing to forgive? Anybody ever have a situation once where someone did something to you and you did not want to forgive that dirty whatever? Anybody? Okay, apparently five of us. Okay, that's good. <laughs> but the fact is, willingness is the most important thing. Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to let go of the pain? Are you willing to release the past? Are you willing to accept full responsibility for your life and your emotions? Because when we don't forgive, we're actually not accepting responsibility. We're putting the responsibility of someone else on our happiness. So being willing to forgive is being willing to accept full responsibility and to take our power back, to reclaim the life that we came here to live. And the second thing is to allow yourself to feel worthy. I've come to realize that forgiveness is an act of love. Forgiveness is saying I'm not going to resent anymore and keep reliving the pain. I love myself enough and I'm worthy enough to let go. Letting go is an act of love. It is realizing I'm worthy of something better than this. And I can free myself to live a happier and more fulfilling life. So I ask you, what in your life are you still holding on to? What in your life has still popped up that you need to forgive and are you willing and do you feel worthy of a life better than you holding on to something that is causing you pain and more frustration? And what happens is when we allow forgiveness to come into our heart and that power to transform us, you know what happens? Wisdom comes in for where that energy used to be. And we become wiser in how we show up. That energy that was toxic is transformed into an energy of wisdom where we show up in greater ways. Maybe we learn to set better boundaries. Maybe we learn to set a higher level of standard for ourselves and how we behave. And not only does that, but when we clear that energy, wisdom and creativity and insight, something greater happens when we forgive. Nelson Mandela was in prison for 26 years and he was able to forgive. Do you think that had anything to do with the fact that he rose to the level of being president? Do you think if he was miserable and holding on to bitterness, he would have been president? He wouldn't have the consciousness to be president if he wasn't able to let, let go and forgive. You look at anyone who has done great things, they've had things run, done wrong to them, but they learned how to let go. They learned how to forgive. And that forgiving freed up energy for them to be more creative, to be more brilliant, to be more insightful. From Oprah and Martin Luther King to Jesus to Mandela to Lady Gaga, like I talked about last week, Everybody who's achieved something great has forgiven something and released some old energy to lift them to a higher place. We've all come here to do amazing and wonderful things, but we need to forgive to lift us. So in what ways are you holding back from being the great person you came here to be? What are you holding on to that you need to let go so it can help you rise to a higher level? Listen to the words of Ernest Holmes. I love this. He says, we are here to know that passing events cannot hinder the onward march of the soul. The temporal imperfection of the human cannot dim the eternity and integrity of the divine. Don't let some incident or what somebody said or someone did or didn't do stop you from the forward march of your soul. Don't let any some mistake or regret stop you from letting the light of the divine shine in you and you raising to a level of making a difference in a, in a greater way than, uh, than you have been because you are here to do great things and don't let something of the past stop you. Are you willing to let forgiveness help heal you and free you to do greater things and to enjoy your life in a greater way? 
Judgment and conflict are a part of life. And they're not here to hinder us. They're actually here to elevate us if we change our relationship and how we deal with them. In terms of judgment, it is to let it be a yearning for your soul to be reassured by acknowledging that we're judging, by asking what way am I judging myself and asking God to heal it, and then affirming our self-worth. And then with conflict, realize it helps us forgive and cleanse by being willing, being Uh, focus on our worthiness and allowing the wisdom of God to come through. Because when we do, I guarantee you, our lives will get better because we will move to a higher level of awareness and we will live life with a greater level of mastery. God bless you all.